that is a huge encouragement. I want to thank you kids for getting up here and, and, and doing that. You don't realize it, but that is a huge blessing for us adults. It, it, it really is. So thank you all so much for coming up and, and singing for us today. Um, last week, we began a new verse-by-verse -verse sermon series on the book of Judges. But in anticipation of a study that I'm going to be doing on the book of Genesis... Uh, in the adult Sunday school class starting on October the 17th, I wanted to briefly interrupt that study in Judges and do a short two-week mini-series. Uh, I am currently teaching the youth uh, Sunday school class about the early chapters in the book of Genesis, and when I teach the adults the same thing, my hope is to answer the questions of where everything came from and why things are the way they are even today. However, there are even more foundational questions than that. For example, there are questions like, is there a God? And if there is a God, which one is the right one? And these are good questions for people to ask. Indeed, unless you die very young or have a mental handicap, everyone will eventually think about these questions. And so back in December of 2019, I led our Wednesday night youth group in a two-week study of these questions. And I also taught an abbreviated version of this lesson uh, at a Baptist student ministry lunch at the Vernon College Wichita Falls campus. And again, given this upcoming Sunday School series, I thought this would be a good time to do this study here. And so let's dive into the question, is there a God? Is there a God? Now, like I said before, this is a good question. But some people, including many Christians, act as if it is a terrible question question. Some even think, maybe, that it is a blasphemous question. But I think the reason why some Christians think that way is because they honestly do not know how to answer this question, and therefore they are scared by it. I remember one Wednesday night, a, a parent came up to me because uh, she was absolutely mortified that her young but ever curious child recently asked her how do we know that God is real and this parent's reaction was understandable because if you're not prepared with an answer that question can be very scary but it's not just Christians who have struggled with the question is there a God uh, an ever-growing number of Americans look at this question, is there a God, and believe that actually it cannot be answered. But did you notice that I said the word believe there? They believe that this question cannot be answered. Yes, I did say the word believe, and I did it on purpose. Because everyone has faith of one kind or another. Everybody does. Uh, if you just look at the definition of faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's the definition of faith. And so if someone says that they don't know if there's a God, press them. Press them. Do you really know for sure that this question, is there a God, cannot be answered? Do you possess all the knowledge that there is? Have you fully explored every nook and cranny in the entire universe at every single time period, fully understood it, and then factually concluded that it is impossible to answer the question, is there a God? Well, of course not. Of course not. So, if you don't know for sure factually that this question cannot be answered, 
Is it not true that you just believe that it cannot be answered? And if a person is honest, they have to admit that they actually believe that God's existence or his non-existence cannot be known, which means it is a faith position. Uh, indeed, the fancy word for this is agnosticism. But notice the ism at the end. It notes that this is a faith. This is a belief. This is a religion, believe it or not. A lot of people don't think it's a religion, but it actually is a religion. Uh, for example, many people today talk about the rise of the nuns, not the Catholic women who uh, wear black and white, but no, the, the, the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, those who say that they have no religious affiliation, that number is growing uh, here in the United States of, of America. But the honest truth is that the nuns, many of which are agnostics, still actually have faith. They still actually have a religion. And their faith is that God's existence or non-existence can't be known. But it is a faith position. It is a faith position. Now, admittedly, agnosticism is not a very complicated religion. It's very simple. It's very simple to just sit back and say, I don't know if there's a God. That's a very simple religious position. But it also has to be admitted that it is an incredibly lazy religion. It's an incredibly lazy religion. Now, this is not to say that all agnostics are lazy. Okay, I'm not saying that. Uh, agnostics can be very industrious when it comes to their education or to their career. Agnostics can also be very involved in relationships with family and friends. Indeed, it is quite possible that an agnostic's laziness only shows up when it comes to the God question. And yet, it is true that laziness and indifference shows up in a very big way in that specific area. And you cannot spruce this up and call it anything nicer than laziness. Now why? It's because the God question, this question, is there a God, is an absolutely loaded question. It is. It's a loaded question. Because the question to that answer is going to affect how you live your entire life. If you think about it, if there is not a God, that's going to affect how you live your life. Because it's basically going to be, today we eat and drink, and tomorrow we die. Uh, you can do whatever you want. But if there is a God, then that's going to affect the way you live your entire life, too. Because now you're going to be asking questions like, how do I live a life that's pleasing to him? And therefore, to not even try or not even care to answer the question, is there a God, is nothing less than supremely lazy. And the profound laziness of agnosticism is made even clearer by the simplicity of the God question itself. Now, I'm not saying that the question, is there a God, is the simplest question in the world. Because the simplest questions only have one of two possible answers, yes or no. But the question, is there a God, is only slightly, only slightly more complex than that. Because in its simplest form, it really only has one of three possible answers. Only one of three, and they're right here. Those are the only three possible answers to the question, is there a God? Uh, and they are no, there is no God or gods. That would be atheism. The second option would be yes, there is one God. That option is also known as monotheism. And the third possible answer is yes, there are many gods, that position being called 
polytheism. Those are the only three possible answers to this question. That's it. It's not really all that complicated. One of those is right. And the other two must be wrong because those are the only three possible answers to the question. And um, like agnosticism, though, we must admit that all three of these possible answers also require some sort of faith or some sort of belief. And this is because, like Hebrews 11.1 1 reminds us, none of us have seen absolutely everything. None of us have. And therefore, none of us know absolutely everything. And so we have to take a faith position when it comes to any of these questions. And one of my favorite quotes outside of the Bible comes from a lady by the name of Dr. Georgia Purdom. She has a Ph.D. in molecular genetics from Ohio State University. And she said, I love this quote, she said, The more you know, the more you know you don't know. The more you know, the more you know, you don't know. When I heard her say that, I was absolutely floored. Uh, and I've never forgotten it. Uh, so it is a faith position. All three of these things is a faith position. That said, there is a difference between blind faith and faith backed up by evidence. Okay? And therefore... Given the evidence of what we have seen, what we have seen, what we do know, because we, we haven't seen everything, we don't know everything, but given what we have seen, given what we do know, which of these three possible answers makes the most sense? Two are blind. One has evidence behind it. Which one's which? Now, let me also say this. You can, and you have the freedom to do this, you can just blindly choose one. Of, the, of these three options that we have, you can just blindly choose one. Just say, I'm going to go with that one. I don't really have any reasons. I'm just going to go there. That's, that's the one I'm going to choose. I don't really have any reasonable or logical reason to go with that, but I'm just going to go with that. You can blindly choose one of these positions, and a lot of people do. A lot of people do just blindly pick one. Um, but if you want to make an informed decision, you're going to ask, where does the evidence lead? We don't know everything, but of what we do know, where does the evidence lead? So for the sake of argument, I want to direct your attention to Romans 1.20. Romans 1.20, this is, uh, besides Hebrews 11.1, 1, this, is, this is the verse I'm going to be camping at today. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, I, I think one of, the, one of the very, very, very important verses in the Bible uh, should be a part of the Romans road. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This is a huge, huge, hugely important verse in the Bible. And the reason why I want you to look at that verse is because the Bible argues that whether anybody has exposure to the Bible or not, as well as here of the question about the guy in the jungle who's never had access to the Bible who's never heard the gospel. This verse says that whether anybody has ever had exposure to the Bible or not, this verse says everyone knows the answer to the question, is there a God, by just looking at the world around them. They don't need to have a Bible to answer this question. They can just look at the world around them and know that there is a God. That's what this verse says. To cite Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, when you look at a building, look at this building, look around. When you look at a building, how do 
you know that there was a builder? How do you know there's a builder? The building exists. It's all you need to see. You need to you see the building. You might not know who the builder was, but you know that there was a builder because the building exists. And uh, Hebrews 3, 4 says, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. When you look at a painting, how do you know that there was a painter? Because the painting exists. You might not know who the painter is, but you know that there was a painter. Romans 1.20 argues that creation itself proves that there is a creator. Now, we know that many scientists, including uh, many but not all of today's scientists, will look at nature and they will deny that God exists. But is this because of the evidence they have seen? Or do people deny the existence of God not because science has ruled God out, but because God's existence would put a damper on how they want to live their lives? I have found the latter to be true most often. Most often. Uh, I, I have shared my faith with many people over the years. One of the most interesting conversations I've ever had with anybody was, was with, you know, you know um, uh, and it was on an airplane. You might wonder, Pastor Pete, how did you even have this, meet this person? God put me next to him on an airplane. And you know how the conversation goes. When you start a, quest, a conversation with somebody next to you on an airplane, you usually ask them what they do for a living, okay? So that's what I did. I, 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 I was sitting next to this guy, asked him, what do you do for a living? And he kind of chuckles, like it's funny. And he says, well, believe it or not, I am a real-life rocket scientist. And he was. He was a real-life rocket scientist. And he was currently working on machines that help us to determine the carbon dates of objects. Oh, my goodness. Wow. You know. And God put me right next to him on an airplane. Um, and so we had a very long and a very interesting discussion because obviously captive audience, he's not going anywhere unless he's going to the bathroom. Um, uh, but, but one thing became very clear to me very quickly as it has with many conversations I've had with people over the years. His beliefs, like those of many people, were not based on evidence. They were not, he's a rocket scientist. But what he believed, and he believed some non-traditional things, we'll say. Um, it was not based on evidence. Instead, it was tailored around how he wanted to live his life. And he was a rocket scientist. But if we look at the evidence around us, if we really do look, if we look at nature, if we apply reason and logic to what we do see and know, if we even use the scientific method and, and, and um, observe and test and study to find out the truth, where does the evidence lead when it comes to the question, is there a God? And the specific area where science can help us is the topic of origins, okay? And the reason why science is helpful here is because the question, is there a God, is closely tied to other big questions like, why are we here? Why is there something rather than nothing? In other words, how did the universe start? How did life start? And to see how the science behind these questions help us, uh, I was greatly helped uh, by uh, a man named Dr. Danny Faulkner, who has a PhD in astronomy from the University of Indiana. Uh, now, before you get worried about how complicated this might be, uh, what Dr. Faulkner says isn't anything beyond what students graduating out of our public education system today would be expected to know. Uh, 
In fact, his argument is tied to one of the most famous formulas, famous scientific formulas in the whole world. You've probably heard of it. E equals MC squared. His argument is tied to that. Now, even if you don't know what that means, and I didn't for a long time, even if you don't know what that formula means, you know, it was came up with by Albert Einstein, one of the smartest individuals of this past century. But if you want to know what it means, what it means is energy, E stands for energy, E energy equals mass, uh, that's what the M stands for, mass being the amount of matter in a particular space. Energy equals mass multiplied by C, C stands for the speed of light, squared. So energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. That's what that formula means. You don't need to understand it. I don't understand it completely, but that is what Einstein discovered and other scientists have said, yeah, that's, that's correct. That's what, that's, we hadn't thought about that before, but that is correct. Now, one of the things that E equals MC squared is famous for is it shows that there's an equivalence between energy and mass. Mass, again, being the amount of matter in this particular space. And this correlation between energy and matter is important because of some other scientific laws, not hypotheses, not theories, but scientific laws that we have discovered over the years, namely uh, the first two laws of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics, just bear with me here, again, this is something we would have been expected to know when we graduated from high school, even though I might not have. Uh, but uh, the, fir the first law of thermodynamics teaches us that energy and therefore matter cannot be created or destroyed. We never naturally observe, no one today has ever seen energy or matter being made from nothing, nor have we ever seen matter or energy being reduced to nothing, it just changes forms. Uh, for example, when you put gasoline in your gas tank that gives you energy to run your vehicle and the gas disappears, we think, because we got to put more gas in, just had to fill up yesterday, uh, but, but really it doesn't disappear, it turns into exhaust, which comes out of our exhaust system, it just changes forms, it doesn't actually disappear. Uh, and so no one alive today has ever seen energy or matter being made from nothing, nor have we ever seen matter or energy being reduced to nothing. Instead, it's like the song, Something Good from the Sound of Music. If you're a Sound of Music aficionado, you're going to recognize this because at one point when they're singing the song, Something Good, uh, the, the the female character, lead character, sings that song. She says, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. I didn't sing that very well, but if you're a Sound of Music aficionado, you picked up on it. Uh, but nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. We know this. And so what happens to energy instead is it just changes forms. That's the same thing that happens to matter. And this is closely tied to the second law of thermodynamics which says that energy and therefore matter though becomes less useful over time. And we understand this too, this is not too complicated. Think about your cell phone, which I don't have in my pocket because it's right there. But think about your cell phone battery. Does it get better or worse over time? Does it, does it hold charge longer over time or does it hold less charge over time? Hold less charge, we all know that. Pretty simple. What about when we get older, as we age, as we leave those glorious 20s and get into our 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s? Do we get stronger over time? Do we get less gray hair over time? No, we get more. Uh, we have, our, our bodies run down over time. That's the second law of thermodynamics in action. Uh, it gets weaker. Now, these two laws of thermodynamics have some very important things to teach us when it comes to answering the question, how does the universe start? Or how does life start? And therefore, the question, is there a God? 
Because according to the first law of thermodynamics, there is no natural, observable, testable, or repeatable process by which energy or matter can be created or destroyed. Not a natural process. That's an important caveat. Now, at first glance, that might lead us to believe, well, maybe the universe has always existed. That might be what we think. And therefore, it has no beginning. But, um, oh, well, let me say this. And if that's the case, if the universe has always existed, then we wouldn't need a god or gods to create it. That's what some people would assume. However, the second law of thermodynamics then comes in and crushes that and says that energy and matter both become less useful over time. And if that's the case, then we know it's not possible for the universe to have always existed. Because according to the second law of thermodynamics, the universe cannot be eternal. It must have a beginning because what we see is what? We see a universe that is wearing down. And so if it's wearing down, it cannot have always have been. Even stars, think about this, even stars with all of their energy, with all of their power, still die and become black holes. Indeed, many scientists warn that the universe will eventually experience heat death as all usable energy will become useless for work and there is no natural process that can create new energy or matter in order to keep things going. And so just based on these two laws of science, and these are laws again, not theories or hypotheses, mind you, we can conclude that the natural universe requires something supernatural, something outside of nature. That's what supernatural means. Something outside of nature, not only to create it, but also to keep it going. This is science. The, again, I'm not saying there's no faith also required, but the evidence leads us to believe that there must be something supernatural, something beyond nature to create the universe and keep it going. And what do we read in God's word? Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 also adds that Jesus Christ is upholding all things by the word of his power. He's sustaining the universe even as we speak. And other scientific laws besides the laws of thermodynamics also back up these claims. The law of biogenesis teaches that life can only come from life. You cannot get life from non-life. It's a scientific impossibility. Um, that's a law of science. We have also discovered that DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, that's what DNA comes from. It's an acronym of that. Uh, that's a language system. It's a language system. It consists of four bases, uh, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, ACTG, but it's a language system. It's a language system that tells you, even when you're first conceived, to grow an arm, to grow fingers, to grow legs, to, when you have an injury, to fix it. That, that all comes from a language system more complicated than even the digital language system of zeros and ones, because this one has four letters as opposed to uh, two. Uh, but it's a language system. Languages don't come from non-intelligence. They don't just appear. Intelligence can only come from intelligence. Languages can only come from intelligence. They don't come from chance, and they definitely don't come from nothing. And therefore, to say that science has disproven God, which we all hear, I've heard it a million times, and I'm sure you have too. They'll say, science has disproven God. No, it hasn't. In fact, it gives evidence in the opposite direction. When you really understand science, it points to the fact that there must be a God. 
that while we cannot, by definition, science cannot observe, test, or study the supernatural, it can only study the natural, okay? Uh, so we can't use science to study God. That's true. I'll, I'll grant you that. But scientific evidence does lead us to believe that there must be something beyond nature. There must be something supernatural which made the natural universe and keeps it going. Science does lead us to believe that that is the case, even though science cannot tell us who that is. But this evidence is significant because it leads to believe, leads us to believe, that the religions of atheism, the religion of naturalism, is false. It's incorrect. But the evidence doesn't stop there, actually. It actually goes on to help us to figure out whether or not there's one God or many gods. So uh, how does it help us there? How, how do we know? So we ruled out one option. Atheism cannot be correct, but how do we know if there's one God or many gods? Well, while there's many different monotheistic religions and many different polytheistic religions, the vast majority of monotheists trace their faith back to Abraham, while the vast majority of polytheistic religions have at least some carryover with the religion of the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. And so... What do polytheistic religions say about origins? What do they say about how we got here? Does it make sense? Well, polytheistic religions tend to tie the origin of different things back to different gods or different goddesses. For example, according to the ancient Greek religion, Phobos, which is where we get phobia from, Phobos is the god of fear. That fear was created by Phobos. Okay? Of course, the question we have to ask is, well, where did Phobos come from? Okay? It's, it's like a little kid question, but it's a good question. It makes sense. Where did Phobos come from? Well, according to the ancient Greek religion, Phobos is the offspring of Ares, the god of war, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love. But let's be the annoying little kid and ask the question, well, where did Ares and where did Aphrodite uh, come from? Okay? Well, according to the ancient religion, Greek religion, Ares and Aphrodite both have Zeus, the god of thunder, as their father. And by the way, Zeus is an ex excellent example of the crossover between the ancient Greek religion and and other polytheistic religions, because while there are some slight differences, I grant you, most scholars agree that Zeus is the same as Jupiter from the ancient Roman religion. He's the same as Thor uh, from the ancient Norse religion. He's the same as Indra from Hinduism, even today. He's the same as Amun from the ancient Egyptian religion. He's the same as Bel Marduk from the ancient Babylonian religion. And he's the same as Baal Hadad from the ancient Canaanite religion. Those are just other names for Zeus uh, and, and his carryover into other religions. But to be the annoying little kid again, where did Zeus come from? Where did Zeus come from? Well, according to the ancient Greek religion, Zeus is the son of Kronos, the, or Cronus, the god of the harvest. But where did Cronus come from? Well, Cronus came from According to the ancient Greek religion, Uranus, the god of heaven, and Gaia, the goddess of earth. But where did Uranus and Gaia come from? Well, again, they say, well, they, they came from Aether, the god of the highest heaven. And then, of course, you ask, well, where did Aether come from? You see how you see where this goes? Uh, where did Aether come from? Well, again, according to the ancient Greek religion, Aether came from Erebus, the god of night, and Nyx, the goddess of night. So uh, the Erebus, the god of darkness, Nyx, the goddess of night. Again, the question, where did Erebus and Nyx come from? Well, at this point, the ancient Greek religion shows its weakness, it gets tired, and it says that Erebus and Nyx simply arose out of chaos or out of the void or out of nothing. In other words, they just showed up out of nowhere one day. 
But does that make any sense at all? No, it doesn't. Because once again, lo logic and reason tells us that something can't come from nothing. You just can't have something just appear out of nothing. It's a it's, it's scientific impossibility. And, and by the way, this brings us back, we can bring this back to atheism too, uh, and, and the Big Bang Theory. And the Big Bang Theory teaches us that nothing exploded and created everything. How much sense does that make? Nothing just explodes and creates everything. That doesn't make any sense at all. Not at all. And so now it's even more popular to say, because the Big Bang doesn't make any sense, now more and more people are moving away from that and they're saying, well, maybe aliens. What about aliens? Maybe aliens are, they came to this planet and they started life here and that's how life got started. Okay. Where'd the aliens come from? Where'd the aliens come from? And ugh, they don't have an answer to that. And then you'll hear other people say, well, maybe there's, there's a multiverse. Maybe there's more than one universe. Maybe there's tons and tons of universes out there. And maybe one of these other universes started our universe. And that's what we get in, like, the Avengers movies and all that stuff. There's a multiverse, okay? That was a, a, a scientific theory borrowed by comic books. Because it's comical. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Because where did that universe get started? If another universe started this one, who started that other universe? Okay? You don't have an answer. And so we need to understand that this origin question goes hand in hand with the God question. And neither atheists nor polytheists can give a logical or reasonable explanation for how everything got started based on what we see. And yet monotheists, those who believe in one God, we can give an answer that makes sense, that's reasonable, that's logical. As Acts 4.24 says, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. Now I realize and this is a good question. You'll have people come up and say, well, who made God? And they think that that question is just as valid as who made Zeus or, or who, you know, made nothing that exploded. They think, well, who made God? That's it. That's, that proves that you're wrong too, doesn't it? Actually, it doesn't. Actually, it does not. Why? Because Psalm 90 verse 2 says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The Bible tells us that the one true God has always existed. That he will always exist. And he has all power. Now, some people might say, well, that's a convenient escape mechanism, but it's not. Instead, this is based and makes sense based on everything that we see and everything that we know. Let me explain. Because if the laws of science and the laws of reason and logic all demand that we have to have a creator, it also demands that that creator must be an uncaused cause, that he must exist outside of nature, and, and that he has always existed because nothing and no one else could possibly exist without one eternal, all-powerful being. It, it's not a contradiction to say that we have an eternal, all-powerful God. In fact, reason and logic demands that there must be an eternal, all-powerful God because nothing else could exist if there wasn't such a thing. That's what we're led to conclude. And this is the wisdom of Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, 
and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. The evidence demands a verdict, and the verdict is that creation proves that there's a creator. And the monotheistic faith, then, is an evidence-based faith, while atheism and polytheism instead prove themselves to be blind faiths. Now, you can still hold to it, because that's what a blind faith is. A blind faith is a faith that you hold to despite no evidence. No, there, there's a lack of evidence, you said, but you believe it anyway, even though you don't have any evidence. The monotheistic faith is still a faith, but it's a faith that has evidence behind it. There's reasons to believe that it's true. It's still a faith, but there's good reasons to believe that it's true. And the monotheistic faith is an evidence-based faith, while poly, uh, polytheism and atheism are blind faiths, and agnosticism is a lazy faith. Um, because given the evidence from what we see, the answer to the question, is there a God, must be yes. There is one God. Of course, the question then becomes, out of the different monotheistic faiths that there are, which one's the right one? Uh, but we're going to wait till next week to answer that question. But I am the pastor of a Christian church, so I think we know where we're going. Uh, but the question I leave you with today is this. Are you afraid to find out? Are you afraid to find out? Because, again, for the vast majority of people, it's not really whether or not there is good evidence that the God of the Bible exists, because there is. Instead, it usually comes down to how you want to live your life. How you want to live your life. Agnostics don't know and don't care if there is a God. Why? Because that allows them to do whatever is right in their own eyes which is what Judges is all about. Atheists say that there isn't a God. Why? Because that allows them to do whatever is right in their own eyes. And polytheists, polytheists are just fine with their gods because their gods might even be more immoral than they are. And in many cases they are. Uh, uh, for most people, their faith is not based on evidence. Instead, it's just based on how you want to live. Because if the God of the Bible is real, you'll have to answer to him. And for many, that is a very scary thought. Indeed, you would have every right to be scared were it not for the forgiveness of sins offered by Jesus Christ. Because it's not enough to know that God is real. It's not enough to know that he is your creator. You also need to know Jesus as your Savior. Amen. Let's pray.